Welcome to Aku Hawaii Stories. I'm Grant Walters. Your host for this episode of our podcast is Louis Anoa, Dean of Student Living and Wellness at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. He also serves on the Aku Hawaii Executive Board as our anti-racism director. Lewis was also the chair of the association's anti-racism task force in 2020, which was charged with examining how campus housing and residence life professionals can contribute to the disruption, if not the dismantling of individual biases and systemic oppression that exists on campuses and in the profession at large. You'll hear some of their work mentioned during this episode. Lewis is joined by four association leaders, all men of color who have either served or will be serving as a Kuhawai president. Harry Legrand, Emeritus Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs at the University of California, Berkeley. Vinnie Gore, Senior Vice President for Residential and Hospitality Services and Auxiliary Enterprises at Michigan State University. Alvin Sturdivan, Vice President for Student Development at Seattle University. And Leon McClinton, Director of Housing and Residential Life at Oklahoma State University, all graciously agreed to discuss their paths to the Akuhawai Presidency and highlight some of the pivotal moments along the way that were key to their growth. Our guests also tip their hats in tribute to many people and places that contributed to their personal and professional development, in addition to some of the key topics and issues that impacted their terms of service and how they still see those persisting in the association today. I know so many of our association's members count these individuals as mentors, colleagues, and friends, so I know you'll enjoy hearing them reflect on their lives and work as much as I did. Here are their stories. Hey friends, um, thank you for joining me. Um, wherever you may be, I don't know if it's morning time or a- afternoon as it is here in New York, but um, this is this is much appreciated um, and, and life affirming, life giving uh, to spend this some time with you today. Part of my, my work on this year as uh, the co-chair for the Anti-Racist Task Force, a, a section of that was, was um, kind of reckoning with the association's history and um, and, and wanting to understand it better, and particularly in ways in which race, issues of racism, anti-racist work has kind of weaved its way through the association's time. Um, and you know, one of the more obvious things that, that you look for is, well, what does the, the leadership look like over time? Um, who have been our, our you know, presidents over time? And four of you um, represent five um, of, of, of Black presidents that have been elected by by our membership, um, but the only five non-white presidents in the association's history. And one of the things you know we want to do with this podcast is is kind of fill in some of the gaps um, you know that we have in terms of our understanding of of what the association uh, was thinking at certain moments in time, but also you know an opportunity to get to know you um, uh, and 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 your experience with the association. So. I am I am absolutely delighted. If we can, we'll go you know around um, and introduce ourselves. If you could let us know where you're at, um, state the uh, the year you were president or years you were president of the association, because that's changed over time as well. And then I'll I'll ask some additional questions. We'll get a little bit more intimate after that. I'll, I'll ask if it's okay for our eldest to go here. <laughs> and I'm, in terms of seniority, I'm going I'm to assume that with, 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 you know, our earliest president here <laughs> in Harry. So I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself and then we'll go to Benny, Alvin, and then Leon, our, you know, incoming president in a couple of years is, is the case. So Harry, you first. So I'm Harry Legrand. I was president of Akuai back in 1995. I think I was the second African-American president after, um, James. Uh, James, yeah. Uh, James A. Heard. Heard, yeah. And I think that was something like 25 years after he was president or something like that. So um, I was at UC Berkeley during my presidency. I uh, was in housing there for about 25 years and then spent the last 10 years as a vice chancellor for student affairs there. I retired in uh, 2016. My home is in uh, Northern California, um, in the Bay Area, but I'm currently calling in from our vacation place up on Bainbridge Island, Washington. So been up here since mid, mid-October and we'll be here till mid-January. So getting a little bit of a change of, of scene. So I think mm-hmm. that's, that's enough. <laughs> 
Hello, I'm Vinnie Gore, and I uh, served as Kauai president from 2012 to 2013. Uh, I'm at Michigan State. My current job is senior vice president for residential hospitality service in auxiliary enterprises. And I'm doing double duty, so I'm serving as the interim vice president for student affairs and services here at Michigan State. I've been here for 13 years um, in five months in two days. Not that I'm counting. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, I'm Alvin Sturdivant. I'm uh, at Seattle University, and I was a KUI president in 2019. Um, I've been at Seattle U uh, for 11 years now uh, and um, have been in the vice president's office uh, the entire time uh, and um, hail originally from North Carolina, uh, where I um, did my college years uh, before um, taking an adventure and moving away and, and, and finding my way around the U.S. My name is Leon McClinton. I am currently the director for housing and residential life here at Oklahoma State University. And I will be president of Kuo I in 2023. So I have a while to, to learn the, the intricacies of the association. Um, I, I, prior to being at Oklahoma State University, I uh, worked many years at Clemson University, um, received my bachelor's, master's, and PhD at Clemson, um, then went to Virginia Tech, um, after Virginia Tech, Old Dominion, and then here at Oklahoma State. So three of those four schools, a land grant. Um, also, you think about it, the primary color is orange, <laughs> so I can't get away from that color. Um, but um, that just gives you a little bit of, of, of my background. All in housing. Thank you. Um, Vincent Harding, this is paraphrasing something he had said, um, you know, believe that, um, you know, education can really only exist with a measured level of intimacy. So I'm just going to ask if y'all could just share a little bit about your kind of backgrounds where, you know, this question that we get sometimes, particularly as, as people of color, like, where are you from? <laughs> so I'm going to ask you this question. Where are you from, from, you know, what, what, you know, childhood, adolescent kind of informed the individual that you are? And then I'll ask this question about an elder um, who's informed your work moving forward. But where are you from from and what does it mean to be from that place? Well, I'll, I'll start. I grew up in San Bernardino, California, which in Southern California, which is about 60 miles east of Los Angeles. Uh, first generation college student. I uh, grew up in a blue collar family. My father worked for Kaiser Steel. My mother uh, was a was a homemaker. Um, was pretty active in high school and then uh, decided to go off to college and some friends of mine from San Bernardino High had gone to UC Irvine. And so they came back and raved about the school. So that's where I, I applied. That was my first choice school. And I got in, even though I had a high school counselor who told me I wasn't college material. I should think about either going to work or uh, going to community college. So I'm the kind of person that when I got that acceptance letter, I went and visited his office and <laughs> sat it on his desk just to kind of put an exclamation point to his, uh, his comment. I uh, was really active at Irvine um, and really was thinking about going into counseling psych at first. Or at first, actually, I wanted to be an English teacher. Then I decided about counseling psychology. And so my degree was in social ecology with an emphasis in mental health. And I had an associate dean there that said I should think about student affairs as a career. And I really hadn't thought about people working on a college campus at all. Uh, but that kind of stuck with me over the, the next three years. I was an RA my sophomore year and I did, did student orientation one summer. And then I did a couple computer student advising and I was, started a fraternity at Irvine and all that kind of stuff. And so when I graduated, I thought, OK, what am I going to do? So my first job was in housing at UC Santa Barbara as a head resident. Uh, I was assigned to their upper division complex, uh, San Rafael Hall. I was there for about a year and then thought, well, if I'm going to make any more money, I better go back to graduate school. So I wound up going to Oregon State. My grad assistantship was in housing, so I couldn't escape housing once I got started into it. Two years there and I graduated. My first job was as director of housing assistant dean for a small private school in Oregon called Pacific University. I was there for about two and a half, three years. My, the dean kept telling me to stay because he was going to retire and he wanted me to become dean, but they didn't pay any money. So I actually left and went to work for the University of Washington in Seattle. I should mention that 
coming out of grad school, I had been offered a head resident or resident director job at UW, and I had accepted it. And I had gotten married the second half of my second year of grad school, and my wife hated living in. So when this director of housing job came up, I had to call Seattle and tell them I wasn't coming. And I used my wife as an excuse that she wasn't excited about living in. So, um, so I didn't go. So, but then three years later, they called me and said, we're creating these live out positions as an area coordinator. Um, Harry, would you be willing to come here and be our inaugural Northwest area coordinator or Southwest area coordinator? So I wanted to go into Seattle and I plan on being there for a while. And I was there exactly one year uh, when I had applied for a job at, at, at Berkeley, my, um, Parents, we had a one-year-old kid and they wanted the grandchild closer to them in Southern California. So as close as I got was Northern California. Went up going to Berkeley as a student affairs officer too, fairly low level, supervised no one, but but an, an administrative assistant. And I was responsible for RA training and selection and advising what they now call RHA, but it was called President's Council there. And each year the director, Ed Hendricks had been, it was when I started was a director, was a, a cool I president. And he retired the next year after I got there. And then I got promoted to oversee um, facilities. I had actually started creating a res life program because Berkeley didn't really have any living professionals. It was all student staff who reported to a facilities manager. So I spent the next uh, several years at Berkeley um, in housing, building that program. And then at some point in around 89, I... Um, was asked to take on food service in addition to housing facilities and res life. So then I had dining services, which are both res hall and uh, campus restaurants. And I think about 89, I also served as the uh, cool I Western regional, um, I don't know, Western Regional Representative, I forgot what the name was now, I think it's, they changed it. So I was responsible for, I think I had California, the Northwest and then the inner mountain region was the areas that I covered. And that was kind of my introduction, but I had a really hard time with my supervisor who on my evaluation wrote that I was always gone and a bunch of stuff. And so interestingly enough, when people called me about uh, running for president in 94, I was really hesitant because I had had such a negative experience with my boss around that. And they called me, I don't know where they found me. I think Jack Collins called me at Christmas time and said, Harry, we really want you to consider running for a Kauai president. And I was like, man, I, not, I gotta really think about this because it was kind of hell to pay at work when I did the when I did the area coordinator or the area representative. So I must've caught him on a good day because I said, you know, I've been called, I'm one of the few African-Americans that have a large enough organization that I could probably be president and that the association is asking me to do that, but I need your support this time and not like I got last time. And he said, okay. and. Um, that was how I wound up uh, kind of in the presidency. I didn't just kind of by accident almost, uh, but it was actually at, at an invitation. So it sort of surprised me that way, especially since it had been so long, since there had been a, a person of color in that role. Thank you, Harry, I appreciate it. We'll definitely get into some of the kind of like career trajectory and um, time in, at president. So, you know, again, thinking about this, this, this question of, of where you're from, from that those more uh, initial t points in your life um, that inform some of the things that you've done later on. So we could keep the order going. So, yeah. so Sonny, if you want to go, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, my uh, father was a career military and my mother was a stay at home because we moved on average uh, three times. Uh, every three years. Uh, I've actually played on three basketball teams. My freshman year, I started off um, in Northern Virginia in a place called Warrington, Virginia. My dad was stationed at Fort Meade um, and then went to South Carolina, lived with my grandmother while my dad got transferred to Berlin, Germany. Graduated from high school from Berlin, Germany. Um, was recruited to play football at Clemson. And the summer... Um, <clears throat> In June, when we went back, my sister was going to the University of South Carolina. <clears throat> I went to the PE Center and was playing in a pickup game and blew my knee out. And the uh, football scholarship went out the window and ended up uh, going to the University of South Carolina. Uh, and I think I was sort of in that population trough where you could, in the middle of the summer, apply and get into South Carolina. Um, I, I lived in the residence halls one year, but was not a student in 
was not a RA. I didn't do anything as an undergrad. I would spend most of my time in student government, student activities, and Greek affairs. I'm an alpha. Um, and like Harry, you know, the dean of students said, you ever thought about going to student affairs? My response was, you know, do they actually pay you? And he, <laughs> so he says, yes, they do actually pay you. And then uh, I went straight to uh, grad school at IU and my assistantship was in housing. And I became hooked from there. I mean, I was, I was came hooked. Uh, I uh, left there, went to Illinois as an RD, and then went to the University of Washington, where Harry and I crossed paths at an interview. <laughs> and it was at an interview. And then he leaves to go to Berkeley. The one of the reasons why I was going there is because I met Harry, <laughs> Harry and Ron Smith, you know, but Harry left. <laughs> You know, so I ended up at the University of Washington and and I cursed out of my breath after my first staff meeting with Pat Schwab, who I personally love, but her idea of a staff meeting short was three hours. So so uh, so I was uh, I was there as a complex coordinator and area coordinator uh, left, went to Wisconsin and uh, was assistant direct assistant to the director of housing. I did everything Norm didn't want anybody else to do. So I did uh, third shift custodial, family housing, and our uh, what we would call our long range capital planning there. Um, my wife at the time was from Seattle and was homesick. So I got a call from uh, Mike Sagawa, who said, you know, we got a job in family housing. We, would you want to come back? So I went back to uh, University of Washington when I was there for another 18 years and similar to Harry, you know, I started off doing family housing then I did custodial and then my boss comes in and says, do you want to do food service? And I go, sure. So I did food service and I did conferences. So it just sort of added it on. And uh, most of my professional uh, involvement was in Northwest Akuba. I mean, and it was just the regional, which I was involved in, um, and had a lot of, uh, I did think about the national, to be honest with you. Somewhat when you live in the Pacific Northwest, it sort of feels like it's a long way away. Um, and then I went to um, Michigan State as the assistant vice president for housing and food services. And um, I got a call from Connie Carlson who said, Bennett, it's your turn. <laughs> That's that was literally how I got I ran for for president because I, I mean I just wasn't thinking about being president uh, at the time um, I was doing the North you know NHTI as stuff and being involved but not running for an office because um, David Stevens who um, was president part of his time was. Um, uh, was at UW when he was, I think past president was when he was at UW. And what you realize is how much travel and how far away you are from your campus. Um, and when you do that, you have to have a good staff. I mean, you just, for two years, um, I was either on the road at least the uh, president elect once a month and then as president twice a month. And you have to have a good staff because you're just not here. Um, and I think that's sort of what impacts a lot of people about making that choice. So I think Alvin, you're up, sir. Sure. Um, so I, as I said earlier, I grew up in North Carolina, rural North Carolina in particular, I'm about 40 miles uh, southeast of Charlotte, right on the South Carolina border. And um, imagine that I would spend my entire life in North Carolina, having grown up in, in the country, um, so to speak. And, and so College really opened up um, a lot of opportunity and a lot of windows that um, I was previously unaware of. Um, I attended North Carolina State University for undergrad and grad school. Um, and so I spent six years on the campus um, and I worked two of the years um, as an RA my sophomore and junior year. Um, and by the end of my junior year, um, similar to what Harry was saying, I, I had a conversation with the associate dean in the College of Education, um, who is an African-American woman that I'd been connected with um, all the way through high school because of participation in some um, education programs. And um, she said to me, um, I don't think you want to be a clinical psychologist. I, I hear you saying that, um, but I don't hear you saying it with so much passion. 
um, you really need to think about a career in student affairs. And despite having been involved in a, a range of different things on campus, I had no idea what student affairs was. Um, and so she gave me a little bit of homework said, go talk with this person, this person, and this person, all of which were mentors of mine. And if you still are convinced that you want to be a clinical psychologist, I will fully support you. Well, certainly, you know, she, she knew what she was doing and, and, and knew me better than I knew myself at that point. And um, I decided that I wanted to go into student affairs and, and I wanted to continue working in housing. And um, I um, ended up back at North Carolina State for grad school. I worked as a graduate hall director um, for those two years and after graduating, um, wound up in upstate New York or central New York at Syracuse University, um, where I worked for three years, um, first as a residence director, um, then as an area coordinator, and finally as the coordinator for diversity education, all in um, residence life. Um, after um, Syracuse, I went on to the University of Vermont, where I um, worked um, initially um, for six months as the assistant director for Res Life and then became the associate director of Res Life. And I also did my doctoral studies there and um, left after five years to go to St. Louis University as their director of uh, housing and residence life. And after a couple of years, though I imagined that I would be in St. Louis for far longer than that, um, I wound up at Seattle University as assistant VP um, in uh, didn't initially have any responsibility for housing. Um, in fact, my first three years, um, housing was not in my portfolio. And then I was promoted to associate vice president in 2013 and, and housing became a part of my portfolio. And um, I was very intimately involved um, in a range of different things in, in ways um, that um, were really exciting um, and rejuvenating for me. Um, not that the other things that I would was doing weren't um, but it, it felt good to be back in housing um, more directly, even though, um, you know, I had supervision for it uh, um, and not day to day responsibility. Um, and as I said earlier, I've been at Seattle University for, um, you know, 11 years now, and um, there's no end in sight as far as I can see, um, because I love what I do. Um, and um, while my family is all on the East Coast. Um, I married locally um, and um, have a huge family that I've inherited here um, in the Northwest and in Seattle, and, and we'll make this home for as long as we can. All right. Um, Leon McClinton here, and I, I also want to just, I want to take a, a second to to thank Lewis for, for arranging this podcast, and you know, I'm just listening to these three legends, housing legends, and I know a little about all of them and um, just feel very honored to be on the same podcast with them. So thanks, Lewis, for, for bringing this, bringing us all together. Um, well, like I said earlier, uh, spent most of my, my, my life and my career at Clemson University. I grew up 20 minutes from the campus. And so I didn't know that about Benny uh, was had a uh, was looking to play football at, at Clemson, uh, which has the best football program right now in the country. Uh, but um, so I spent most of my time there. My parents went to school there. Uh, so I was walking around that campus as a seven year old. And um, so very familiar um, at a young age. Uh, but I will tell you, I think the probably the most uh, for me, the most remarkable uh, discovery in my development was um, when I went to Clemson, I was extremely introverted. It was very overwhelming. Um, I just could not find my niche. And, um, and towards the end of my sophomore year, well, my freshman and sophomore year, I lived with the RA. And towards the end of my sophomore year, the RA says, Leon, why don't you consider a, applying to be an RA? You seem very responsible. You talk to the residents that come by to get toilet paper and the vacuum cleaner. I said, sure, why not? And um, I asked, so what do you have to do to, to, be an, to apply? He says, well, you interview for it. Now, that's how introverted I was. When he said you have to interview for it, I said, I'm not interviewing for a thing. That's out of the question. And, um, and so I come back my junior year, and my roommate, the RA, did not come back. And so his boss stopped by my apartment and says, would you be interested in the job? And I said, Absolutely. He says, I'll come back in a few days and 
let you know what I find out and came back in a few days with a staff t-shirt said, you can take this t-shirt if you accept the job. And, um, I remember the first weekend, I think of the semester, um, I got a call, I'm on duty and I got a call that, um, Leon, there seems to be a big party at the bottom of the street. I lived in an apartment community and says, you need to go address it. And at that very moment, at that very moment, I felt like I was the most important person on Clemson's campus. I went to my, my bedroom, I got my clipboard, my incident report form, my name tag, and um, went down there, dressed the party. And, you know, looking back on it, I think it really, for the first time in my undergraduate life, I felt like I had a sense of belonging. And I felt like housing really has helped make me be the person I am today. And, um, and right then and there, I started to come out of my shell, um, and spend more time interacting with my peers, uh, started developing leadership skills. But I was an uh, undergrad pursuing a, a bachelor's in textiles and realized that is not something I want to do. Actually, freshman year, I'm going to plant, I'm going to textile plants, and I'm coming out of those plants with an allergic reaction. So obviously, that was a sign that I should not be going into textiles. <laughs> and, um, and so, so I, uh, I, uh, Struggled as an undergrad, really finished with like a two, four, two, five, not really a great student. And uh, I said, I want to go to grad school. I really like what my boss did, supervising RAs. I like that. And um, was able to get into human resources at Clemson and, um, and just continue to flourish. Really enjoy being a, a graduate, hall, graduate um, student hall director. Um, took my job very seriously. I had a hall council, students that volunteered. We put on big time programs for the campus to the point where our vice president would come by. I just really enjoyed that. And I think with my parents being uh, middle school teachers for 40 plus years, and they stayed in their fields and their profession for years um, and being educators, I felt like in in a way, you know, I'm an educator. It may not be just like what they were doing in in the traditional sense, but you know, I'm being an educator. I'm influencing younger lives. Um, and um, I decided, you know, I think this is what I want to do as a career. And after I graduated, I went to Eastern Kentucky University, took an area coordinator job and was there and enjoying it. First time being away from home. And uh, during my first semester, Clemson called me back and said, we have an opening. Would you want to come back mid year? And being a young professional, you don't really understand really well. It's, it's easy to, to, to not understand all of the, the political ramifications on decisions. And so I decided to, to go back and um, was there for working there full time for 12 years. I, I, I remember during my first year, I started thinking about, well, maybe I should look at a Ph.D. program. Clemson at the time, you could take up to 12 hours for free every year. And I remember talking to my mother and, um, and I said, you know, I'm thinking about this. She says, son, time is going to pass. Why not take a class a semester? And um, so um, during my time there, I was promoted, I think, three times. And well, I went from an RA to a graduate student to an area coordinator at Clemson to an assistant director and associate director. So I was promoted several times during the housing program. And then applied for the director of res life position at Clemson. And so probably my first big disappointment, I think, um, loved the school and so much and felt like I did a lot. And so turned out I did not get that position. And, um, and so that same summer, I didn't get the position. I graduated, I got my, my doctorate. And I remember my father sharing, he says, I know you're disappointed, but son, getting the PhD is going to help you long-term. And so a year later, uh, Virginia Tech. I got a position at Virginia Tech and uh, director of res life. They had a bifurcated system. So I was director of res life, but then there was a director for housing and dining. And so really I was over the residence education aspect of the program at Virginia Tech. And um, I um, really um, enjoyed, you know, that position a lot. I, I remember I was so proud. I was so proud to be a director as one of my goals. And when I set out, and then started this journey. And I remember going to an Akuai conference. I had the job maybe for two months or so. And 
um, at the Kauai, well, Kauai conference. I think we're in Austin, Texas, I think. And, um, and so there's an icebreaker for a session and you had to tell, you had to share your name and where you were working. So it got to me and I stuck my chest out and I said, I'm Leon McClinton. I'm the director for residence life at Virginia Tech. And there just was an immediate hush across the room. And it made me realize that probably a lot of people would not, did not envy or did not want that position at the time because I got the job four months after the massacre that occurred. And so um, thankfully I'm a person that um, I'm never going to shy away from hard work. Um, you know, I've always been very disciplined and responsible. And so during my four years there, I thought the timing was perfect for me. I thought that I was able to help that staff um, recover from a very unfortunate situation. Um, and then there were some, some, some leadership changes there. And, um, and I took a lateral move to um, Old Dominion University, Director of Residence Education. It was my first time being at a, 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 an urban type setting, being in an urban type setting. When you think about uh, uh, Clemson and Virginia Tech, um, land grant, um, you're looking at the black student population hovering around five to 7%. And then I go to Old Dominion and you're looking at about a 22, 25% black student population. And, um, and so it really allowed me to, to feel like to it put me in a position to where a lot of, for a lot of the black students to, to be a role model, strong role model for them. Um, but um, when I set out to start this journey, um, I wanted to be um, a director for housing and residential life at a major school. And, um, and Oklahoma State gave me that opportunity. And I've been here for now five and a half years in the same role. Um, and I feel like we've done a lot. And I, I could go on and on. I don't want to bore you, but it's really neat. I have one of assistant director, um, um, a black male. And uh, just within the last few months, he has started his doctoral program here at Oklahoma State and asked me to be on this dissertation committee. And so it's just very rewarding to be able to support um, younger professionals. That to me is the biggest reward for what we do. Thank you all. Much appreciated. Um, the depth there um, in terms of your histories and your travels. I'm, I'm, I'm curious if there's a, if there's a way um, with some brevity here, if, if you could think about people in your life, um, you know, that you've crossed paths with that have been in your life. In this moment, try to identify one individual um, that you, you know, that you really, really appreciate. I want you to name them. Um, I want you to name an attribute that you love about them and, and ways in which that's informed your work. Does that make sense? So name the individual who you're thinking about, name, name and at, give an attribute about them that you love and ways in which that's informed the way that you do your work. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. So I'm going to go first because the person I'm thinking about is on the call. Hmm. And, uh, and I've known Harry for almost 35 years. And, um, and so because we were part of the PAC-12 conference, um, we've had opportunities to sit in various different spaces together. And you know, one of the things that Harry always had, the unique ability, and there aren't many people, I would say we, there's a cohort of us, um, Harry, Willie Brown, and Shirley Garrett. Um, so there's a cohort that always gets, but Harry has a way of understanding the big picture and understanding um, political ways of, of things and to be very succinct in terms of to articulate that to folks. Um, I still remember um, this one PAC-12 meeting where he says he got a call from the chancellor that told him to go feed the people in the home, the homeless people in, in People's Park. And he had his catering staff go down to do it. And Harry never did say, no, this is not what we're supposed to do. But it was the right thing to do for the institution. You know, and I would say there weren't many people who were directors that would have taken that position, who would have seen 
that as being um, as is being why am I spending student money to do that? But Harry sort of saw this as what's the role of the institution in terms of playing out societal in supporting those who who don't have us what what we have. So you know I, I think that's one of those gifts Harry has that he's embarrassed to say, um, but I think his colleagues would who have known him would would say that. It's very kind of you, Vinny. Thank you for that. You know, I'm trying to think of one person. You know, when I think back to being a young professional and I think back of a cool, my cool eye experience, probably, uh, and I would say there are probably three individuals who made me feel really welcomed. Uh, I think my first conference was actually in Tampa. I had just started at Berkeley back in like 81 or 82, and I had negotiated a national conference as part of my uh, package there. And I remember Jim Grimm and Jim Grubb and Doris Collins being three individuals that uh, really made me feel um, welcome. And I just kind of watched those individuals kind of over time, it kind of in my professional work life, it, it would probably be the, the chancellor that I had at Berkeley just before I read uh, the chancellor before the last chancellor that I had before I retired, uh, Bob Bergeno. And um, what I found with Bob is that he, he was Canadian and he had a really different sense of the world, the world. And you know, he took a chance on me. I was the first person to be vice chancellor at Berkeley uh, that had a degree in higher education. Every vice chancellor before me for the last 25 years had been either an English professor, a history professor, a botanist, an architecture professor. And I remember uh, some, some of my staff that were on the committee said, you know, the faculty were really pushing for another faculty person in that role. And the chancellor told them, I need somebody who understands students. And that's why I think Harry is the right person for this this role. And so I, I just kind of watched Bob from afar. Uh, he was always very um, reasoned and uh, allowed me to grow and do what I wanted to do uh, without limitation or without question. And so I would say that that, you know, kind of my most recent past and even to this day, he writes me every now and then says, when hey, when this pandemic's over, let's Let's our wives go out, let's go out to dinner again. Um, and I don't think I ever told him that. I think I, I've kind of had um, people that I've admired from afar, but never really kind of vocalized it. I did tell one individual on a, on a Northwest um, retirees call for a NASPA recently, Bob Gentry, who was the associate dean, who actually told me to look into student affairs as a career. And I actually told him thank you, because probably if he hadn't put that bug in my head or in my ear, I never would have followed this path that I actually wound up going on it. So uh, that, that, that's probably about six people. I never can follow instructions, but that's probably why I was a vice chancellor, because I was just rogue. So sorry about that. <laughs> no stress, Harry. Take all the time you need, friend. Take all the time you need. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, when I think back to uh, folks who've invested in me um, in my career in my life in general, um, you know, my, my brain goes back actually to, you know, my first mentor um, from undergraduate, who's still a part of my life, um, Dr. Lathan Turner, um, who's now at East Carolina University, um, but was the director of African American Student Affairs at North Carolina State um, when I was an undergraduate student there. And, um, you know, Leon earlier was talking about being shy and introverted, and, and that was very much my narrative. Um, as well. And Dr. Turner saw that um, and um, took time to really connect with me and to push me in ways that others couldn't um, and, and wouldn't have been able to. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the clear lesson um, um, or impact that he had on me was all about investing in your people, your students, your staff, whomever they are, invest in them um, and, 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 and give them belief, um, even when they perhaps don't believe in themselves, um, by providing them with resources and, and, and just space and opportunity to connect and to talk about the, the issues that are up for them. And, uh, you know, he, he was really that presence for me my entire um, undergrad and quite honestly, all, also through grad school. 
And um, I, I try and emulate, uh, you know, the, the kind of leadership that he provided and the kind of mentorship that he provided um, for me um, to those um, who are coming up after me. Yeah, this is Leon McClinton again. And, you know, when I think back, I for many of my, I think for my, my earlier years, I think I struggled having an official mentor. Um, but what I did was I observed people that I respected and, um, and really tried to emulate some of their, their best practices. Um, Verna Howell, Verna Howell was the director for housing and residential life at Clemson for many, many years. And, um, and so I, I grew up under her leadership and, um, and really, uh, probably my second year as a grad student, but definitely probably during my first to second year as a professional, I said, I want to be what she is. I want to be a director of housing and residential life at a major school. She was extremely professional. She was highly responsible. She was very organized. She, uh, you know, I would watch her in meetings and she would have insightful questions, insightful comments. Um, and I just really uh, spent a lot of time observing the way she went about her work. And, and I have to give her a lot of credit for um, getting me into getting, getting me involved, helping me get involved in uh, CEHO. So CEHO is a Southeast region, covers 10 states. And um, I had always been very responsible in my work. And I thought I had helped the housing department move forward. And I'll never forget, it probably was 2000 or 1999, I was sitting in a hotel at the end of the CEO conference in um, Alabama, I believe we were in Alabama. And um, I'm waiting to get, wait for my ride to get back to Clemson. And Verna Howell comes up to me and says, Leon, I'm about to be either president or president-elect of CEO. We've created this new position, member at large. And um, I, can, I can appoint whoever I want. Would you be interested in serving, serving in this role? And of course, I'm not going to say no, even though I don't know what this is. I'm shy and all this. If Bernard Howell is going to ask me to um, attain this position, then I am going to do it. And, you know, looking back on it, I remember the first executive or second executive board meeting. I don't think I slept the night before because I wanted to do such a good job on my report. And uh, this is a brand new position. Really, no one really knew what to expect from it. But you know, it was something I was asked to do and I wanted to do it very well. And um, so that was in probably 2000, I think, or 1999. I know she was president, I think, in 2002. And um, but that launched me into getting involved in the placement center and then chair the placement center or placement um, center committee and um, presented a, a ton. And then Vera Jackson was I think past president of CEO and she saw my work and she asked me to um, accept the nomination to run for president. And, um, and so in 2007, I was CEO president. So I think that all started with, with, with um, Verna Howell asking me to be a member at large. So I thank her for, for taking a chance on me. Thank you. Thank you all um, for sharing that. I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, each of you kind of reflected on, on your particular path, maybe, Leon, maybe not as much just yet, but um, those moments when you decided to run. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the moment you found out that you won <laughs> um, and how you were feeling in that moment. And, and maybe I, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, like um, as folks with a, a particular history, uh, as folks who carry on our families and our ancestors in, in particular ways. I'm asking you, yeah, what do you remember about getting that call and, and, and what you were feeling and that in relation to your, to your family's histories and struggles and triumphs? Yeah, I would say I was kind of stunned because uh, I was running against Chuck. God, uh, he was at, he was from Texas. Um, and he had been in this association way longer than I had and was, I thought, more well known than I was. So when I actually was, when they called and told me I had won, I was like, I was like, 
gobsmacked. I mean, I was like totally <laughs> surprised because I didn't think anybody knew who I was because I I had I had been no I had been in an officer in like the regional association. I jumped directly from being in nothing into the the uh, uh, the Western Regional representative, and then to get the uh, who I call, and I I think it was a sense of pride. I thought for me, because I knew that it had been so long since an African-American had been in the leadership role with the KUAI. And it gave me a sense of pride that the organization, I think, uh, was it recognized that and was aware of that and were willing to to make that happen. But I, I, I wish I could remember what Chuck's last name was now, because we were, we, were di- we were district reps. I think he was in the Southwest region at the same time I was the Western. So, so I was, I was surprised. I, I, I will, I will definitely admit that I had no, no sense that I was going to win. Well, I, you know, I would say I was like, sort of like, unlike Harry, where um, I didn't have a role nationally. I did most of um, my work in Northwest Sakuo and was the host chair for Northwest Sakuo in Seattle in 2007. Um, and so when Connie called, I was actually surprised because, you know, I didn't have a high profile across, um, across a cool eye. And I ran against Patrick Call, who was at Arizona at the time. And Pat was the Western rep and had done a lot of things nationally. So um, I, I remember putting in my writing my um, synopsis for it and thinking, yeah, there's not a chance of this. So I didn't even think about it and was completely blown away when I got the call saying from Connie saying that I was elected. I didn't, I mean, I was like, you know, really? <laughs> no, because I really didn't think that that I would be it. And, and then the next thing I went, I went, oh, like, oh, that means I got to live up to Harry. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> it was that sort of thing where you know who your elders are, right? And so, and you know the standard of leadership, and that's that's the thing that I thought about. I thought about Connie, and I thought about Harry, um, two people who I uh, uh, had admiration for in that role as leaders. And so, um, same thing with Norm Dunkel, and going, oh gosh, this is I've got like like these big shoes to fill as as presidents there. So that's what I was thinking of. I had a fairly similar reaction. Um, I, you know, <clears throat> I was elected in 2016, uh, in, um, which was also um, just after um, I got married. And I was actually on my honeymoon um, when I got the call from Tom Ellett, um, letting me know that I'd won um, the presidency. And quite honestly, um, the entire time I was running, I, I never really expected that I would win. I was running against TJ Logan, um, who at the time was at the University of Florida and in the Seho region, which is my home region uh, or home or region of my origin. And, um, you know, Seho carries a lot of, of weight historically um, in election cycles. Um, and, and I just felt like, OK, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm interested, I'm passionate. Um, I feel like there's something I have to contribute. But again, at no point did I ever expect that I would win. And so when when I got the call, um, I was literally sitting on the balcony um, of our um, suite um, during our honeymoon, uh, you know, enjoying the sunrise because we were in the um, Caribbean um, at the time. And um, I. I, I said, are you kidding me? Uh, and, and Tom said, no, you, you, you won. And it was the exact same thing that uh, Harry and Vinny said. I said, OK, I guess the real work begins now um, and, and, and we're going to have to get this going. Um, but the, the, the reality was, you know, I um, in the, the, the two years or so prior um, to my run, had the opportunity to see um, Vinny as president in a um, new um, that um, there were giant shoulders um, that I would have um, to stand on, um, along with the many others um, who came um, before him. And, and, and being um, that I was on the board as an ex officio member prior to my run, and, and I was looking at the experiences of people of color in the association, I was keenly aware um, of the presidential legacy um, that had been left um, before me um, and, and, and took that rather seriously and um, was excited and felt privileged and honored 
um, to be able to, um, you know, move into that role um, after Harry and Vinny and James um, had done it before me. Wow, such great stories. Um, I tell you, when I got the call from Alvin um, that I had won, I, it just, I got pretty emotional because I, I thought about what happened in my career about um, seven years prior, eight years prior. Um, I think we all, if you stay, if you stay in a, in a particular career or stay in a particular field or you're on a career track, you're going to have some ups and downs. And I felt like I had a, I had a major down. I, I had a very unfortunate situation occur in my career and um, not to go into details of that, but to the point where it did not um, make me want to go to cool. I for about four years or five years, I was embarrassed about what happened. And, um, and then after I got the director of res life housing job, housing residential life job at Oklahoma State, um, unfortunately, it made me feel it made me feel proud again. And um, and it made me feel like, you know, I do know this. I do know this field and I'm good at it. And so in 2016, the conference was in Seattle and uh, I was asked to do one of the sprint sessions, do one of the do a presentation for one, for one of the sprint sessions. So the sprint session was divided in two groups and I had mine done prior to the conference, just like everybody else. I had an idea of how this was going to go in my head. And so I was part of, I was part of group two. And so group two, I think went a day or two days after group one, Benny was in group one. And uh, so really Benny, I think played a, a role indirectly on me um, being in this position right now. So I went to the sprint session. I heard Benny do his presentation and I'm like, oh my goodness, he's like a machine. I mean, there's no hesitation. I mean, it's fluid, uh, just extremely professional. I did not expect it to go. I didn't, did not know you had to do it that way. So immediately after that session, I went to the nearest uh, drugstore and picked out a bunch of note cards <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, but I think I locked myself in my hotel room for about a day and a half because I want to do a good job. I'm thinking, OK, you're going to be no telling who's going to be there. It could be hundreds of people. So I want to make sure I did a good job. I didn't go anywhere else. And um, during that time, preparing for that. And it must have I must have done so well that Tom Ellett came up to me afterwards and says, you need to be a co-op president. And, um, and so I'm going to go back and if it hadn't been listening to Benny two days prior to motivate me to be better in that presentation, I may not be sitting here, but he and Deb Smith Rogers really pushed and really campaigned for me, I think for a few years, um, want, um, trying to get me to be president of Cool I. So that's what came to my mind and that we all have downs in our career, but there are people that will believe in you and you've got to focus on that and not the people that may not be for you because they're everywhere you go, there will be people for you. You just have to seek them out. I might just add one more thing. Cause I had forgotten about this. I think Willie young who recently just passed away, I, I think was another mm -hmm. kind of influential person. I never felt like Willie really ever got uh, the recognition that he was, he was always this quiet behind the scene kind of strength. And I remember he was the one that termed me the, the, pre, the people's president when I became a Kuai president. And everybody called me that like for that year. And I was trying to be so inclusive. Um, I was dancing with any and everybody at the parties and uh, just trying to be kind of open and receptive to what was going on. And so um, and when I got the news that Willie had passed, it really kind of hit me hard because he's he was always a, a, a solid, quiet strength uh, behind kind of almost everything that we did. So I was, um, uh, hopefully and getting the recognition, um, that I think sometimes he, he didn't get, um, uh, when I was reading this recent write up on him, I thought, okay, people did finally get it, but it's unfortunately when people are gone is when they finally realize it. So I just thought it, I just want to add that piece of there. No. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, uh, for bringing Willie into the space. Uh, I, I wanted to add one of the things that um, in terms of just kind of the history of the association, uh, uh, you know, Alvin, and I don't know if it's always been the case that once a president leaves, they become kind of chair of the nominations committee. 
right? And so I don't know how long that's been the case, but one of the things that happened this past year, right, right, is that Alvin is the one that makes a call to say, hey, we want you on the ballot, you know, and this, this is why I think you should, you need to be there. And, um, you know, so Leanne, Leanne and I, we're connected because we were on the ballot together along with James uh, Bridgeford. And when I got that email, you know, from Kuwai, and I saw our three faces, <laughs> I, we, we, we already won, we already won. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I won already. You know, there was a particular moment. It's just like, oh, this is this is a historical moment for the association. That the that the that the, the at the top of the bill in terms of who's running for president, three men of color. There's some questions about kind of <laughs> you know masculinity and all, and 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 particular roles for women that we could, uh, and particularly women of color that we can get it. We'll get into a little bit later. But I just wanted a to acknowledge that, that part of the work that y'all do is this kind of tapping on, on the shoulder or providing inspiration in Benny in the way that um, you did for Leon and Harry in the way that you did for Benny and then Alvin in the way that you did for both Leon and I, right? That this tapping of the shoulder is really important. Identifying individuals to say, hey, I think this is for you, even if we don't see it in ourselves in the same way. And so I just wanted to, well, to thank all of you. Um, thank all of you for that. I'm trying to, there, there are a couple of different questions that I have here. This partly related to maybe what Harry um, brought, brought up here. I am wondering about during your presidencies and, and then Leon for you, as, as you're thinking about your, I, one of the ways that in, in looking at the history of the association is that while there weren't uh, folks of color as presidents of the association, they were definitely there <laughs> providing support and you know, leadership in their own way. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if we can, can name those individuals, the, 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 the individual, the, the professionals of color, BIPOC folks who supported you, um, because I think, some, you know, it's easy, it's easy to find your, your names in the history of the association, a little bit harder, right, to find the names of the other and to understand how they may have in, impacted you. So thinking about professionals of color during your time as president who, who, who supported the work that you were doing. Um, and Leon, I, I, you know, question, you could think through that question, figure out how you might want to jump in on that, because I know it's coming up for you. Yeah. So, you know, I would say um, Willie Brown, who's at UC Santa Barbara, um, has always been that person who may not want to be in leadership role, but is a leader. And, um, you know, he is one that I, I mean, I can get on the phone and and talk to Willie and about everything. Uh, Sherry, Shirley Garrett, who's at Stanford, is another one of those who um, that you can always count on as leaders who, and Shirley has an outside, outsized personality. I mean, you know, she's just, um, but she's probably also one of the smartest people you'll ever meet. I mean, just smart, and uh, but who also really cares, especially about, people of color and women of color. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, so I sort of think about that generation of, of leaders who, um, who spent a lot of time. And most of us I'm saying are on the West coast, you know, cause that's where I spent most of my career was, you know, 20 years on the West, on the West coast. And that's where I spent most of my time at. Um, and I, I'm blanking on her name, sure. Uh, Harry at uh, UC Davis. Oh. Emily? Emily, yeah. Uh, Emily, Emily is another person who has been just an outstanding person and as a professional and who is very uh, supportive. And, uh, and I know during my presidency, um, if I think about the people I just named, I didn't, I got emails, I got calls at various different times. You know, if you need anything, if you want anything, please. I mean, you know, there, there was this community around that. Um, Willie also too. I mean, Willie, uh, Willie was one of, he was the elder statement, statesman for the uh, profession. Um, and so there were all these people who, who um, in their own way made a significant difference for a lot of folks who were leaders, but not formal leaders in the association. You know, the, I, um, there was a posse that I kind of had, that kind of ran with. I, I thought I had all kinds of people supporting me uh, while I was president. I mean, I talked about Willie Young Sr. in particular, but um, 
there was Frank, who was at Cincinnati, um, Chuck Rhodes, of course, um, you know, uh, Jamie Washington, Vernon Wall. I mean, Jamie and Vernon had both been Akua I interns for me at Berkeley. So we had kind of gone, gone on that path there. Uh, Mary, Miriam Rosado, who was at the uh, University of Michigan, um, and several, there was just several others. Um, I, I think when I was thinking back, back in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, kind of the Latino and Asian population was pretty small still, as far as leadership roles or in their involvement in the association. And I'm, I'm kind of, um, drawn a blank on a couple of those individuals who also were really supportive I thought of me uh during my doing my presidency I actually got Marty Takamoto uh kind of involved Marty was had been in charge of orientation at Berkeley and then I pulled him over when I was in housing um to be my special assistant and then asked him sent him to his first Akuai conference and then he became he fell in love with it. and then I said you need to run for uh, kind of district rep and so he, he wanted me doing that so I think Marty Takamoto was another person that I could could point to for, for, for me, I'll, I'll tell you, maybe she may be responsible for having the, the most impact on my career. And uh, many of you know her, uh, Kawana Leggett, currently interim associate vice chancellor and dean of students at Washington University. Just a, to me, a remarkable story. Um, she was one of my student leaders when I was at Clemson and worked in our, in our, in our office and um, very quiet extremely quiet. Um, but apparently I must have had a huge impact on her life. And um, she has made, uh, she's had a successful career in our field and has held several leadership positions in a cool eye. Um, I mentioned earlier about a very, very low point in my career. And she knew about that. And with me, I mean, she's gone on record. I mean, a couple of years ago in Denver, at Denver, she shares at the sprint session that, um, you know, that I'm, I'm her mentor to hundreds of people. But during my low point, um, my mentee allowed me to lean on her. And um, I remember she, she was very intentional on getting me uh, connected, getting, my, getting me back on my feet. I remember her, I think there was a, a, some type of podcast program that was coming out, coming out of NYU. And so she recommended me to be on one with um, one of our other um, bigger names in the profession. And, um, and she just, there were other, other opportunities that she put in front of me for me to pursue. And, um, and so she is just someone that I owe so much to. And you, a lot of times we think about people that are, um, older than us that have more experience that may have the most impact on our careers. But uh, when I think about everyone, no one may have, I think she's had the most, most impact on my career. Kawana Leggett. It, it's interesting. I, I, I feel like I had a, a huge amount of support um, during my time, um, not just as president, but the entire time that I was on the board um, and, and there are countless folks um, that I could, um, list off. Um, um, certainly, um, um, though, um, the Professionals of Color Network um, was um, instrumental um, in, in my five and a half years or so um, on the board, and in particular, um, Charles Holmes Hope and David Jones, um, when they were co-chairs, um, and then um, Yeti um, Marquez Santana um, and Kiwana Leggett as well, um, were all um, uh, you know, significantly supportive of me and my leadership and the work that I was trying to do on behalf of the association in the field. Um, there are also folks that were in my corner um, from the very beginning. Um, Jennifer Wilder, um, who is one of our recent um, Parthenon um, recipients, um, who's also a mentor of mine from my undergraduate years. Um, Keener Scott and I had the benefit of being on the board um, with one another, um, and, and she was immensely helpful to me um, in my decision to even run for president. Um, Leonard Jones, um, who um, is um, not um, necessarily involved in major leadership positions within the association, um, but he is a present um, and is always there and willing to share his voice and his feedback, um, and I always felt um, supported by him. 
I also had the benefit of having the most diverse board in the history um, of the association, um, where 50% of our board members were um, of color. Um, and, and those folks were um, amazing to work with. The, the entire board was, of course, um, but there was something special um, about the group of seven of us um, in 2019. Um, Lewis certainly is one of those um, seven, um, but um, Shigeo, Nyella, uh, Dan, um, James, um, Olin um, were all um, a, a great support to me um, in, in 2019. And, and what we were able to accomplish um, was in large part um, because of um, their willingness to share their perspectives um, and their opinions, uh, but probably most importantly, my knowing that they always had my back. Um, whatever it is we were dealing with, um, we were in the trenches um, together. And so um, I, I'm just, uh, you know, eternally grateful for um, everyone um, that that was there, but certainly um, those folks that I just named. Thank you. I might jump into it a little bit of a heavier topic in the, these last few minutes together. Um, you know, one of the things that that I that I think has 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 happened, in, you know, in 2020, it's only a leap, particularly for the association, right? Um, uh, Von Stange, he, 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 you know, goes ahead and puts the anti-racist task force together, which in and itself is a rather historic kind of moment for the association, right? That throughout the history of the association, particularly in its earlier part, um, issues around race and racism were politicized, right? So to make a statement about black and brown bodies or to make a statement about BIPOC bodies, right? Was a political st statement, not a humanizing one, right? Um, and, and uh, but, oh, you know, 2020, this particular moment is say, well, we, we can do something about about racism, we can address racial injustice as an association, a particular moment. I'm curious about, um, you know, Leon, for you, this would be 2020 and the ways that, that 2020 has shaped you. Um, you know, Alvin, 2019, we have the El Paso shooting, the, the, the Jesse uh, Smollett incident, uh, we have New Zealand, New Zealand, we have the admissions uh, scandal. Harry, for you, Nelson Mandela was the elected president of South Africa when you came into office. Uh, we also had OJ going on. Uh, the crime bill, the, the most, you know, the three strikes and you're out was also passed out in, dur during your presidency. I'm curious about the ways in which these kind of national global things um, that are occurring, particularly around race, um, impact influenced your, your presidency and, and the sense that, of, of like um, responsibility that you feel that, or, or not, that the association has to say something or do something as these things are going on. Does that, does that make sense? Well, uh, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, some, some of the thoughts I have, Lewis, is, well, first of all, I think a cool eye as a whole has definitely made a statement um, to the profession that, um, that diversity, equity, and inclusion is extremely important. And you see um, many forums, round table conversations, initiatives directed at addressing DEI um, issues. So, so I commend Nicole I for, for being a leader um, in higher education. Um, I, you know, I, I think because of some of the work um, or information that Cool I has put out um, over the years um, um, has helped me be, uh, I think, a, a better professional and has helped me um, be productive on my campus um, to the point that um, the president of our university um, a few months ago, um, after having several conversations with um, some of our students of color and about the, the um, deficiencies that we have on our campus, um, the president decided to put together a DEI task force and asked the vice provost of the university and me to co-chair that. And, um, and I think that um, the president of our university has acknowledged and respects the type of work that we've done in housing to be able to ask me and have confidence in me to help lead this very important, co-lead this very important initiative. Um, we're seeing across the country, across the country, I mean, it's almost, you know, it's the same situation where Many of our underserved, underrepresented, marginalized students are coming forward to higher administration and saying that we want to have a voice 
we need certain initiatives, certain programs in place to help us be successful. And, um, and so, you know, with that information, I mean, just last week, I'm reading about University of Maryland, reading about Harvard University, um, you know, it's just all across the country. I think that um, a cool eye moving forward can definitely play, be a leader, play a major role in helping transform these institutions and helping them be more intentional with helping and supporting our UUM students. I was going to say back in back during my era, although those things were going on, probably the biggest the biggest issue happened to be around uh, the proposition in Colorado about women. And I remember the the conference was supposed to the year I was president. We were supposed to be in Colorado, in Denver for that conference. And Akuai, we made the decision because they had voted against the amendment to actually move the conference. And so. Uh, all the planning and hotel, and I mean, all that stuff had been arranged. And I think I was actually at the last year we were actually on a campus because uh, I think the next year we were in Rhode Island uh, when Jenny followed me. And so the cool, the cool I made the decision uh, to move that conference to, I think Bob Schmigan from New Mexico State offered to host it. So we wound up moving the conference from Denver uh, that summer to uh to New Mexico State. So I would say that a Akuho, and I think this happens in housing just in general, because we're kind of a microcosm of society. We're going to probably see it first in residence halls, then the, rec, then the rest of the campus will see any issues that kind of bubble up. And so, you know, the OJ, you know, trial was, of course, a big deal. Mandela, everybody was celebrating that. Um, but I really think at, the, at that time that the bigger issue probably was around women and what was happening to women uh, in the country is what I kind of remember us focusing, focusing our, our attention on and actually taking a really firm stand against. You know, the, 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 the issues that you raised um, from 2019 going into 2020 are absolutely um, those that had an impact on uh, my year as president. And, and, and honestly, um, I, I would argue that my entire time on the board was framed by diversity, inclusion, and equity related matters. Um, but I, I think um, probably the most significant um, piece um, was that we were in the third year of uh, a U.S. presidential administration that influenced the regulatory landscape of higher education in, in ways that for many of us was extremely negative um, and influenced the way um, we were able to engage with our students on our own campuses, um, but also um, held an anti viewpoint for essentially every historically underrepresented and marginalized group in history. Um, and, and, and that called on us to, to, to think about um, things differently, to talk about things differently and to do things differently. And so while my platform was also grounded in that um, the work um, was also um, you know, quite a bit um, about that in the time that I was president. Um, you know, it, it, it was also um, a time when um, our members in the respective campuses were really calling on us um, to put our voice out there and to have it count um, in the conversation about all these matters um, and to help influence what was happening on um, home campuses um, by providing resources um, that provided, um, you know, our members um, with what they needed in order to enter into conversations with university leadership and administration about all these matters that were really important um, and had um, pretty significant um, impact on the experiences of students living in residence and, and, and what have you. And so, you know, when I think about El Paso and Jesse Smollett in the Christchurch killings and woundings, um, of nearly 100 um, folks um, in the admission scandal, um, all of that sort of wrapped in what was happening in the U.S. with our administration um, really influenced, uh, you know, the, the work that we did during my presidential term. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm very proud of what we were able um, to accomplish um, and of what Akuhawai has accomplished since um, I left office um, because the work has continued and has only uh, been enhanced in that time. I know that this is pretty much the time that I've, I've, I've you know, that we asked of y'all so this hour and a half. So just really want to, uh, to appreciate, I mean, I, it'd be hard to not, you know, like just want to acknowledge the, you know, the leadership Academy, something, um, again, 
dreamt of um, and um, and realized during your your time. And you know, for me, one of the things as we didn't get to ask ask this particular question, but you know, it, it is. A, uh, it was hard for me to look at the the history of leadership in the association and recognize particularly that women of color have not gotten there. And so, you know, one of the things that I think the, the Leadership Academy has done is to provide, right, particular avenues for mid-level folks who are, who are ascending in the profession to be closely connected to the association, to see the association as home, and hopefully have those opportunities moving forward. And that there are the other folks that certainly that we need to be pulling in or tapping on the shoulders to make sure that, hey, um, you need, you know, you need to be considering. And it's one of those things for that, that, you know, I'm proud to be engaged in right now and certainly looking forward to sorting, you know, continue to, to push the association forward in, in, in providing these, these uh, leadership opportunities for all folks, but specifically for, for women of color, BIPOC women um, in, in our field. So um, just wanted to leave that there, not so much as a question, just as, as much as a direction <laughs> uh, for us. Um, Anything y'all want to just say before we wrap up our time together? This has been an absolute, absolute honor. Lewis, again, I, I can't thank you enough. This has just been such a treat going into the holiday season to be able to take some time and be part of a program uh, with three other uh, colleagues. I have, have the utmost respect. Um, it's great finally meeting you, Lewis, and having some direct dialogue with you. Um, I know your future's bright. Um, I know that um, you've already have had a major impact on a cool eye and looking forward to working with you in the months and years to come. Yeah, I, I would share similar sentiments. Um, one, I'm, I'm grateful for having had the opportunity to share this space with Leon, with Harry, with Vinny, and with you, Lewis. Um, you know, it's not um, very often um, that I'm able to be in a space um, with men of color and leadership um, who've all sort of traveled the same pathway um, and to be able to talk about our experiences um, in ways that are meaningful um, for us. Um, and so I'm, 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 I'm especially grateful um, for that. Um, and also again, for Akuhoi creating this platform um, as a way um, to push out more voices um, so that folks have an opportunity um, to, to hear the stories um, of those um, who um, perhaps have influenced, um, you know, their, their journeys, even if we ourselves aren't necessarily aware of that. Um, and then, you know, lastly, just to co-sign on the last statement that you made, um, that, um, you know, that is absolutely an area that we need to do better in, in creating more space and opportunity for BIPOC women in particular um, in leadership roles um, in um, having, I know you said don't answer this, but in, in having um, served as um, the chair of the nominations and elections um, task force and having done some outreach um, to a, a number of women of color, um, one of the things that I'm aware of and I think others should be aware of is the, the heavier burden um, that many BIPOC women are carrying that influences their ability to pursue these kinds of leadership opportunities. Um, and what that calls for um, from us on our respective campuses, but also as an association um, so that, um, you know, th those folks can be freed up in the way that I was able to be freed up in the way that Leon was able to be freed up in order to take on this, this, this role and these opportunities. Um, and so um, we as an association and as higher education need to do better in the supports that we provide to BIPOC women in order to pursue these same kinds of opportunities. Punto. <laughs> That's the period right there at the end of the sentence. And that concludes this episode of Akuhawai Stories. I'd like to thank our hosts, Louis Anoa, as well as our guests, Harry Legrand, Vinny Gore, Alvin Sturdivant, and Leon McClinton for joining us. This podcast is hosted on the Podbean Network. Past and future episodes can be found at acuhoi.podbean.com or via our website, www.acuho-i.org slash podcast. And of course, we hope you'll subscribe to the podcast via your favorite streaming service so you don't miss an episode. Our main site also has a wide range of helpful resources, events, and initiatives for campus housing professionals at all levels. You can additionally follow Akuhawai on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'm Grant Walters, and I hope you'll join us again soon. Until then, I hope you and yours stay safe and healthy.